الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين We continue inshallah our study of uh, the life of Imam Ahmed and in the last session we have uh, studied some of the deviations uh, in aqidah in iman and creed and we have discussed in more details uh, some of the groups that sprung up and some of the deviated beliefs that sprung up at the time of Imam Ahmed uh, rahimahullah. And uh, today inshallah we will speak a little bit about the uh, aqidah of Imam Ahmed, the opinions of Imam Ahmed about all these controversies, about all of these uh, uh, conflicts in, in matters of aqidah and matters of creed. And we will speak about the group that caused most problems that really wreaked havoc at the time of Imam Ahmed and that is the group of Al-Mu'tazila uh, and that is because they were able to reach the highest level of the Islamic State at that time and that is the Khilafah. They were uh, very influential and they were able to influence in Khalifa Al-Ma'mun like we uh, discussed. Uh, the opinions of Imam Ahmed regarding Aqidah and regarding Crete. First we saw how following philosophy and following logic led people to deviation. And Imam Ahmed, he was against using common logic, human logic in matters that are beyond human abilities. And that is the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and matters related to the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like believe in qadr, al-iman bil qadr wal qadr. And he would uh, follow the, uh, the concepts to stop at the sunnah, like we said last time, a sunnah tawqifiyya, to stop at the text of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he had an opinion uh, about leaving those who use logic and philosophy and not even argue with them, to leave them and to just stay away from their uh, premises, to stay away from their path, and to stay away from their schools. And uh, in, uh, in many quotations, Imam Ahmed would say, لَسْتُ بِصَاحِبِ كَلَامِ وَلَا أَرَى الْكَلَامَ فِي شَيْءٍ مِنْ هَذَا I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a person who uses uh, logic in matters of religion. إِلَّا مَا كَانَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَأَوْ حَدِيثِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Except what was in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or an ashabihi, or the ashaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أَمَّا غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ فَإِنَّ الْكَلَامَ فِيهِ غَيْرُ مَحْمُودٍ Other than that, then speech and argument and logic and philosophy is something that is not desired and it's not something that would lead into guidance. Uh, the Imam Ahmed gave very uh, clear opinions about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we went through the principles of the sunnah regarding attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala last session. And Imam Ahmed would say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah as described himself in the Quran. Allah, if you want to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you read the Quran and you stop at the Quran. You don't go beyond the Quran into any matters of common sense. Uh, common human sense, any matters of, of logic, any matters that are within the realm of human understanding, unless what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that He is. And He said, تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ بِلَا كَيْفِ you, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't ask how. That's what we said last time, one of the, uh, one of the principles of sunnah is you don't ask how about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we mean by that, and when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala samia. Allah ha all hearing. We don't ask how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listens? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears? Does he have an ear? Does he have an eardrum? These are questions that are considered part, uh, is, is really a type of kufr, type of rejection. And there are things that we don't go into except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us that he is. If we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sami' we say amantu billah. Allah is sami' Allah is all hearing. Allah hears everything. We don't know how, or we don't ask how. We don't ask how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this and do that. And what happens is like we will see is some of the deviant groups like the Mu'tazila, they said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laysa kamithlihi shay, 
Thus, this, these attributes may mean something else. Although in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in many, many uh, positions, He called Himself as Samir. And with, when uh, He said to Musa and Harun to go to Fir'aun, He said, إِنَّنِي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى I will be with you and I will be listening and I will be watching over you. I will see and I will listen. And that we, they believed in Allah and they went on and they faced Fir'aun. And thus a Muslim does what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to do and they believe in the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without arguing about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, same thing is what Allah, what, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the things that uh, you will see in many history books is really the, the matters that were matters of discussion and conflict, like the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Ahmad said, لِلَّهِ يَدْ كَمَا وَصَفَ, كما وصف بِهِ نفسه. Allah has a hand like he said he has a hand. But we don't ask, what does that hand look like? Does he, what, what hands, you know, we don't know that and we don't ask about it and we just believe in it like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, his sahaba believed in him. And there are many, really, uh, many verses that confirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a hand and we don't know what they are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse uh, 64. And he, uh, in another place in Surah Sa'd verse uh, 75, مَا مَنَعَكَ أَن تَسْجُدَ لِمَا خَلَقْتُ بِيَدَيْ He told, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking to Iblis, Allah, and he said, why didn't you not prostrate to what I have created with my hands? With my hand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said he created Adam with his hand. How did he do that? Allahu A'lam. You know, this phrase, Allahu A'lam, is a treasure for a Muslim, for a believer. There are things... We, we don't know, and they are beyond our realm of knowledge, and they are beyond language. Language is not enough to be able to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His attributes, so we stop to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used, and that was the manhaj, that was the method of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. And in, in many other uh, verses and attributes uh, in, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and uh, one attribute that Imam Ahmad spoke about and he gave opinions about is sifatul kalam. The, attributes of, the attribute of speech is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like they argued those groups about the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hearing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's face, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand. They came to the attribute of speech and they said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not speak because speech is a, an event. Speech, this is their twisted logic. And, and that's how they conformed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to human logic, no matter what it is. They said, speech is an event that happens at a time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond space and time. Thus, they could not understand how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak. They just could not get it in how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak and how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is beyond time, he is Beyond space, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created space and time and all these relationships and things we understand and things we don't understand. And what they said, they said that because a speech is an event, it's something that happens at a certain time, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since he is not limited to time, thus he, Allah, does not speak. And they really threw away all the verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book said, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa certainly with his speech. And taklim is a masdar, is a source of a word in the Arabic language. And when the source of the word comes behind, comes after the verb in Arabic, it is used to affirm and confirm that this verb has actually happened. We said, I have, I have actually I have eaten, I, if you say I've, I have eaten firmly, if you want to really make sure that people believe you, said, said, I have eaten, you know, you put the source of the word after the verb. And Allah, this is called tawkid, this is called affirmation, this is called uh, really confirming the verb. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this particular figure of speech in confirming that he speaks. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمَ So the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves no doubt that he is the one who's speaking. And the Mu'tazila said, no, Allah doesn't speak. Allah put his speech in the tree or in the stone. And then the, the tree spoke to Musa, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Now they had no reference. How did they came up with this? What, what was their reference? What was their evidence for what they say? Logic. Right. And that's the difference between Ahl Sunnah and the deviated groups. Ahl Sunnah stop at the Quran. If it doesn't make sense to us, then we don't know enough. That's all there is to it. If something doesn't make full sense to us, we still believe in it, and we take it as it is, and we don't try to interpret it, we don't try to twist it, we don't try to make it conform to our logic or to our language. Well, like we said, an example of that, when the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, when they were given an order by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, pork is haram, they wouldn't go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and said, why is pork haram? What is the logic beyond, behind tahrim al-khamar, behind uh, making wine haram? They would never, I mean, you look at the sunnah, you look at the seerah of the sahaba. Not one sahabi went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him, does that make any sense? And we just celebrated Eid al-Adha. Ibrahim alayhi salam was ordered to slaughter his only son Ismail. He was not even, he didn't get a direct order, he saw it in his dream. And Ru'ya al-Anbiya haq, did he ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what sense does that make? What is the wisdom behind that? Ismail alayhi salam, his father, he was a young man. He was a young teen. He was, you know, many, uh, there are difference of opinion about how, how old he was. But he was a young man. Very young man. Did he ask his father, well, why are you going to do this to me? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want you to kill me? You're my father, you're a prophet. They don't ask. This is Islam. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they obeyed the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they did not question the wisdom. They didn't even want to understand why. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ When they confessed and professed and practiced their Islam, when they submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is Islam. Islam is not to freeze your brain, it's not to freeze your mind, but Islam is to use your brain intelligently. To use it in a smart way. To use it in things that you can understand. So you don't waste your powers, your intellect, on things that you will never be able to encompass and get the, the ideas for, for that. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book always says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for thinking about, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah would say, Think about the verses of Allah. Think about the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. But don't waste your time trying to make sense of things that you can never make sense of. Things that are beyond your human capability. It is not smart to waste your life or your intelligence trying to get things that you can never get. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, use your powers in a constructive way. I gave you the brain so you can understand my signs. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي مَاذَا يَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ They think, they contemplate about the creation of heavens and earth. They don't contemplate trying to understand how Allah created this, when He created this, how did He do this, how did He do that, what logic does that make? They don't waste time on the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same thing, the people that argued about qada and qadar, about the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are questioning, and in, in the, the bottom line, there are two, like we said that last time, and we'll repeat it the, this session, that there are really two motivations for that. Number one, not understanding and questioning the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An example of that is this, the, the disasters and the calamities that happen. The, the calamities that, like for example, the earthquake in Pakistan. We had the, recently an event, those miners that, were, that died in, in that uh, mining incident. And a theologian or religious man was on TV, uh, not a Muslim obviously, and he said, the God I know doesn't do this. The God I know doesn't do things like that. Well, who did it then? You know, and what they do is they try to question the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they can't understand it, then they reject it. Now the difference between us Muslims is we accept it. Even if we don't know what it means, if we cannot decipher it, because we understand Allah is above us. The wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like our wisdom, then this world can be comical. 
And if you go back to history and you see what people would have decreed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have a different plan. Even for his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to move his da'wah, his message outside Mecca, where did he go? He went to a ta'if. Allah said, no, I want you to be in Medina. Right? Allah sent him the people of Yathrib to him. And while the Prophet ﷺ was making an effort trying to go to a Taif, because Taif is stronger, Taif is, is much, um, it's easily defensible, and the people of a Taif are strong people, and they're rich people, and they, you, really, you can really establish a much stronger state in human logic. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's wisdom is much more different than that. And we cannot, and did the Prophet ﷺ question it? He said, what is happening to me, if it is not your anger and it's not your wrath, then it's not a problem. In لَمْ يَكُمْ بِكَ غَضَبٌ عَلَيَّ فَلَا أُبَالِ And you see the same thing about the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if we digressed a little bit. Surah Al-Kahf that we Muslims inshallah recite every Friday, that we see the story of Al-Khadr and Musa alayhi salam. Now there were actions that Al-Khadr, this righteous man, the learned man that was he was doing, by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that made no sense whatsoever to Musa alayhi salam. I mean, he would kill a young, he would kill a boy. He would kill a child. And Musa could not stand it alayhi salam. He said, أَتَقْتُلُ نَفْسًا زَكِيَّةً بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ لَقَدْ جِئْتَ شَيْئًا إِمْرًا You are doing something that is completely, not only undesirable, this is something that you cannot, you know, stay quiet when you see it happening. He would be on the ship and he would, you know, put a hole in it. And people would, you know, Musa said, you, people will drown, people will die. What are you doing? This is wrong. But what was wrong to a human person, to even a learned human being like Musa alayhi salam, made a lot of wisdom to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah explained it to Al-Khadr and Al-Khadr explained it to Musa later on. And it made sense after, after Musa learned it. This is for Muslims, for us to understand that not everything has to make sense as we see it, at the time when it happens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just reassuring us, it will all make sense to you at the end. Just be patient, do what you're told, and things will happen to you, and things will make sense at the end. Not, in this, not necessarily in this life. Not necessarily in this dunya. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just say, trust me. You are in good hands. Just believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do what you're told. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw his sahaba arguing about things, matters of fate and destiny, he said, Ali hadha khuliqtu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for this. You were not created to try and to judge the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You were created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to fulfill his message on earth, and to be a good human being that spreads peace, mercy, and carries the message of the Prophet ﷺ. This is our message in life. Concentrate on it. But the Mu'tazila did not. And that's why we will see how Imam Ahmed and many other ulama, radiallahu anhum, they knew the danger of even given any, any ground of compromising on any minor issue. It would destroy the aqidah. It will destroy Islam as we know it. And that's why it was very important for Imam Ahmed and the ulama around him to hold their ground and to, stood, to stand firm uh, against this great tribulation of Al-Mu'tazila. Who are the Mu'tazila? Al-Mu'tazila, this group, did, you know, we, we knew about the Mu'tazila fitna which started in the year 218 after the hijrah of the Prophet wasallam at the time of Al-Ma'mun. However, Historically speaking, this group started much earlier than the Abbasid time. It started at the time of Bani Umayyah. And it is started by, uh, um, actually, one of the great tabi'een, one of the great followers of the Sahaba, and he's very well known, very famous, Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah. He had a halaqa, he was a great teacher, one of the greatest scholars of this ummah. And he would teach aqidah, he would teach hadith. Al-Hasan al-Basri is one of the greatest scholars. And time really is not enough to speak about uh, his uh, talents and his attributes and his knowledge. But Imam Hassan al-Basri had a halaqa, which is, really was the University of Iraq at that time. It was a great teaching place for, for the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And one of the people that was his students, that was in his halaqa, 
His name was Wasil ibn Ata. And Wasil ibn Ata was a, a, a person that was exposed to logic, was exposed to other things, and he would try to really bring these premises of philosophy and arguments into the halaqa of an Imam al Hassan al Basri. And Imam Hassan al Basri would be patient, in, in, but he would not, of course, Imam Hassan al Basri would not change anything that is related to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they had a conflict about one issue. And that one issue was, what would happen to a person that uh, commits an enormity, commits a capital sin, commits a kabira, one of the kaba'ir, a'adhanallahu wa iyakum minha. And Imam al-Hasan al-Basri, like the people of the sunnah, we went over that in detail in prior sessions. Uh, Imam al-Hasan al-Basri said, when they make tawbah, then they go back into the realm of Iman and Islam, like they are. But if, even if they die while, while they're committing their enormity without repentance, then it is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what to do for them, what to do with them. Allah can either forgive them, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can punish them, and they are... Uh, des- they deserve the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have to call them Muslims. If somebody confesses and la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, believe in Allah, his messengers, his books, his angels, and believe in the day of judgment, believes in al-qadr, then that is a Muslim. That is a Muslim. And when he, they, they qam al-salah, ita'u zakah etc., they are Muslims. Even if they commit an enormity, uh, like you know, many of the enormities that we know, then they are Muslims. And even if an enormity is really uh, not doing one of the pillars of Islam, like some Muslims do not fast. I mean, you know, I've, I've seen Muslims, may Allah guide us all, so I get headaches when I fast, so I'm not going to fast. Right? And I mean, you know, they say that's, that's, that's what it is. Now, is that a Muslim or not a Muslim? According to Wasil ibn Aqa, that is not a Muslim. That is a kafir. According to the people of the Sunnah, he is a Muslim. He's a Muslim fasiq, meaning a Muslim that is outside the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when that person dies, he is buried in the graveyard of Muslims. When that person is to be uh, given any inheritance, any inheritance any, if he's an heir to a Muslim, then that, is, that person can receive the inheritance of another Muslim. Wasil ibn Ata said, no, that is a kafir. Imam al-Hasan al-Basri did not agree with that, so Wasil ibn Ata i'tazal. He left. He isolated himself. Al-I'tizal is to isolate yourself. He left the halaqa of Imam Al-Hasan Basri and he took some of the, he started his own halaqa and he had, he isolated himself from the great halaqa of Imam Al-Hasan Basri. So Imam Al-Hasan said, I'tazalana wasil. Wasil has isolated himself from us and this group started being called Al-Mu'tazila. And Al-Mu'tazila, they started having logical premises and philosophy and matters that they called al-umur al-aqliya, matters of intellect, intellectual mind. If something doesn't conform to that, then they rejected it. And they're, they're, like we said, their reference to, to, to their, they, they would not use, they would use some of the verses, but they would twist the meaning of the verse to conform into logic. The base is not the verse. Now you will see in their argument, they will use some of the Ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They use some of the verses of Quran. And these people were not ignorant. They were highly intellectuals. I mean, they were very well educated and they were exposed to many philosophies and many uh, foreign, uh, like Greek philosophy and Persian, Persian uh, cultures and all of that. And what, but their premise, their solid base was al-aql, was their human mind. And if things do not conform to the human mind, they either interpret it in their own way or reject it altogether. Say, this doesn't happen. And that was how the, the group of Al-Mu'tazila started. And to, to really uh, be, be counted as a Mu'tazila, there are five basics. There are five principles for Mu'tazila. And the Mu'tazila are more than nine groups. Now, they, they deviated among themselves. There is Al-Jahidiyya, there is Al-Wasiliyya, the, among themselves, there are many groups within the Mu'tazila themselves. Because once you, you depend on logic, logic can cause more deviation, can cause more trouble. Because what I think is right, you may not agree with me, and you go into, we go into a discussion. And if we don't agree, you become a group, and I become another group. So this is how they, exactly how they did it. And, but, but they all had common principles. 
And these five principles are very well spoken about and they're very well established in Aqidah book and history books. And they're established so you can avoid them. Now on the surface, these five principles looked really, really good. And any Muslim would be attracted to the titles. Wa alaykum salam. The five principles of Mu'tazila are At-Tawheed, great. Al-Adl, justice, fantastic. Al-Wa'd wa al-Wa'id, promise for Jannah. Al-Wa'id, warning against hellfire. Al-Manzila bayna al-Manzilatayn. Now this is what Wasil ibn Ata' said. He said, this Murtakab al-Kabira, he is not a Mu'min or he is not a Kafir. He is somewhere in between. Now, Wasl ibn Ata was different from the Khawarij. The Khawarij said that person is completely a kafir. Now, Wasl ibn Ata said in this dunya, he is not a Muslim when he's not a kafir. He is somewhere in between. And that is one of the principles of Al Mu'tazila. And then the, the last principle they said ordering good and prohibiting vice. Al Amr bil Ma'ruf wa Nahi an al Munkar. Now, what's wrong with any of that? I mean, except Al Manzila bin Al Manzilatain, which is an innovation. Does anybody see anything wrong with the other four? Nothing wrong, really. But that's not what they mean by the word Tawheed. Let's see what they mean by these words. A Tawheed to them is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laysa kamislihi shay wa huwa sami'u al-basir. As Allah said, they started denying some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say this sifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not conform to common sense, does not conform to logic. Thus, it must mean something else. So they rejected that sifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They rejected some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they called this tawheed. Now why did they do that? They did that because they were actually responding to another deviation which is called the, the figurative or the literal understanding of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those are called al-mushabbiha. Al-mushabbiha thought that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Yadu Allahi fawqa aydihim, the hand of Allah over their hands, then Allah means a hand like ours. Right, they, they, are, they understand words literally. Now that is the extreme, that is one extreme. The Mu'tazila took the other extreme. They wanted to make tanzi. They say Allah is above all of that, then that means Allah doesn't even have a hand. Right, so they went, they rejected the whole thing because they could not understand it when they asked how and why and what does it mean. Well, the sunnah, the position of the sunnah, like we said last session, is we take it as it is and we said, Allahu a'lam. Huwa kama wasafa nafsa. Allah like he described himself. We don't know. How can you know? You're a human being. And Allah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amma yaquluna aluwan kabir. So to them, tawheed, they rejected the attribute of speech. Like we said, explained a minute ago. They said Allah doesn't speak. And that's why when they really fell into this problem with the Qur'an, well, if Allah doesn't speak, then what is this? Oh, this, this is the creature of Allah. This is not the speech of Allah. They said, Al-Qur'an laysa kalam Allah. It is a creature like us. Because speech is an event, and the Qur'an was revealed at a certain time, and it is an event, then that, that Qur'an must be a, a creature of Allah. It is not the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Despite many of the verses... And many of the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ narrated, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and we will, we will uh, say that in, when we discuss this problem a little bit later, they rejected all of that. They said that must mean something else, because our brain doesn't tell us so. So they started tawheed for them, as they rejected the speech. And one of the other issues that they rejected, and that actually became a problem more at the time, of Al-Wathiq, Al-Khalifa Al-Wathiq, is they said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen on the day of judgment. But we have a verse in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذَنْ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ There are faces that are glowing with, with happiness and glory, and they are looking, these faces, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of them, they are looking at their Lord, right? And they said, no, إِلَىٰ نِعْمَةِ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرًا they, they are looking to the glory of the kingdom of their Lord. Now, where did you come up with that? I mean, when did they come up? They just twisted that. There is no basis for twisting these verses. There is no hadith. There is no sahabi that explained it that way. There is no alim that explained it that way except the Mu'tazila. So they would twist those meanings to conform into their logic. And any questions about that so far? The, 
Yeah, the question is, uh, the, 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 to look at Allah, to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, brother said, isn't that the highest thing? This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon his servants that will get into Jannah. It is. It is a high, but the, 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 the issue is, the, the, the question for them, can you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or can you not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And today say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen. Because for a human being to understand vision, now vision to us is what? To see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah has to be an object. And we only see objects. We only th- see things that reflect photons or emit photons. right? And to see something, to see, uh, for example, uh, the, the moon, you have that moon has to be in, in a direction. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not conform to these things. So they couldn't understand how would we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they rejected the whole thing. They said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen. Now we don't know how we're going to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we believe in it. Why do we believe in it? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said you will. Why do we believe in it? Because it's in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does, you, sh- you cannot ask how. Some of the, like we said, some of the principles of sunnah, there are things that you don't ask, how am I going to do that? Or how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would do that? Because it is beyond our understanding. And we leave it as is and we say, Allahu a'lam, amantu billah. Allahu a'lam, amantu billah. There are things that you don't waste your, your, your time, you don't waste your religion trying to, trying to understand. There are things beyond understanding of a human being. So that was the Tawheed. Now Al-Adil, justice for them, what justice is great. Now justice for them is they became Qadariyya. Now those who were here in the last two sessions know what Qadariyya means. Qadariyya said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates everything, but he, can, he cannot be the creator of anything that is evil or bad. Because if Allah is just, and he will take people into accountability, then why? how come Allah created evil and let people do evil and then take them into accountability? So they said, it must not be those, the, the evil cannot be the creation of Allah. It is the creation of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now to make this tanzee, to, this is again logic philosophy. To make this tanzee, they went into majusiyah, they went into manawism. They said there is a creator of good and a creator of evil. There is no but one creator of, in, 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 it's, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, that is the premise of Tawheed. But to really, for them to understand justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they wanted to put that into premises, into, into logic, into rules, and they could not. So they had to come up with a theory to justify what they believe in, and they said, Al Abdu yakhluqu afala. A human being creates his own deeds. And that is really, we, we spoke about that in the last few sessions. And it is, it is against uh, the, the basic principles of Iman. They made the creator, this is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's will, His universal will. They said the, the creation uh, of Allah, the, the, the sins are outside that. They are the creation of, their servant, of His servants. So they put creation, they put a will outside the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they put creation outside the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is kufr. I mean, that is kufr. We don't know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us into accountability by the choices we made, but no choice we make outside the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how does that jive together? We don't know. You, you don't spend your time trying to understand, you have to believe in it. And there is one creator for our deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ الصَّفَّاتِ 96 Allah has created you and Allah has created everything you do. Now people do evil things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have created everything. And the wisdom of Allah is known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you are taken into accountability only on the things that you have full choice but still, nothing you do outside the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to them, adil, to them the word justice meant that they went into kufr and they became qadariyya. They became people that say the, the, the evil is not created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal billah.
We Muslims believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates everything. وَنُؤْمِنُ بِالْقَدَرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ We believe in the qadr, good and bad from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe there are things that we will never understand its wisdom. We don't understand why, why disasters happen, but we know it is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preordained that. And we are responsible for our actions. This is the, the thinking of the people of As-Sunnah. So that is the second concept of Al-Mu'tazila. The third concept is promise and warning. Al-Wa'du wal waid Now promise of Al-Jannah for the, the people that do good and warning for the hellfire for the people that do bad. And to them that means that a committer of enormity or a capital sin is condemned to eternity in hellfire. They said if promise is true, then warning is true. And there is no room for forgiveness. Now who can say that? Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah forgives whom whoever He wills and He torments whomever He wills. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said لَا يُسْأَلُ عَمَّا يَفْعَلُ وَهُمْ يُسْأَلُونَ Allah cannot be asked about why He does this. Allah is not taken into accountability. We are. We have to understand our position. We are the ibad. We are slaves. And a slave cannot leave his position. Now there is a, you know, point of calling us Ibad al-Rahman. The slaves of al-Rahman. This is why you called Abd al-Rahman. This is why you called Abdullah. This is why you called Abd al-Aziz. We are slaves. All of us. Now even if your name is not Abd, you know, you are still a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the highest honor. But we have to understand maqam al ubudiyya the station of being a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A slave, now we don't have slavery in these days, so sometimes it's really not an easy concept for us, but they did and they understood. You know, a slave does not ask his master why you're doing this. When a slave is given an order, it's like military, right? I mean, the closest example to us today is military. You know, when a general gives a, a soldier a command, soldier just goes and does it, right? I mean, you don't question your master. And how do you question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not only they're questioning Allah, they say, this is what Allah will do. He will take the person who fornicates to eternity in hellfire. No matter what good that person does. Now there is many examples in the hadith like the sahabi that, the, uh, that was brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was an alcoholic. And he was being brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam time after time after time to be punished. And one of the Sahaba cursed him. He said, you know, لَعَنَهُ اللَّهُ مَا أَكْثَرْ مَا يُؤْتَى بِهِ oh, May Allah curse him how, how often he is here, you know, for being punished. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لَا تُعِينُ الشَّيْطَانَ عَلَىٰ أَخِيكُمْ إِنَّهُ يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Do not be a helper for shaitan over your brother. He made a mistake, but he loves Allah and his messenger. So who are you to really pass a judgment on another person, especially if that person... Is, it, is someone who says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, loves Allah and loves his messenger, commits a mistake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, those who commit this mistake, they are worthy of the punishment. Doesn't mean Allah has to punish them. Allah has to do nothing. You know, we have to do things. But he is our master, we are his slaves, we don't tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what to do with people, even if they are committers of enormities. So that is the, the other misleading concept of Al-Mu'tazila. The fourth concept of Mu'tazila is the station in between. Al-Manzila bayn al-Manzila thing. They believed that the committer of enormity is not a believer or not a kafir. Now they, they had to, to take a position that is different from the Khawarij. The Khawarij said whoever commits an enormity is a kafir. The Mu'tazila said no, we cannot really call him a kafir, but he's really not a Muslim. Well what is he? Well he's somewhere, somewhere in between. So they, they had no name for it other than somewhere in between. You know, where is that in the Sunnah? Where is that in the Quran? You know, Allah subhanahu wa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Arafah, on the day of Hajj al Wada, told us by the, His revelation, Al Yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum, wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, wa raditu lakum al Islam adina. Today I have completed your religion for you, I, I have perfected your religion for you, I have completed my favor upon you. And Allah is pleased with Islam as our religion. Now, was, where was that? Where was this station in between? Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ tell anybody about it? How come Wasl ibn Ata' knew it? 
and the Prophet ﷺ didn't know anything about it? How come Abu Bakr didn't know anything about it? How come Umar didn't know anything about it? How come all these great Sahaba never spoke of it? And all of a sudden, this man comes and he said, oh, there is actually a, you know, a new category. How did you come up with that? Well, common sense. You know? This is how this is how deviations start. And they were good speakers. They had good, you know, they had really good knowledge. And any person who doesn't have strong knowledge in the sunnah, it was they were easy to be misled by these Mu'tazila. They were really very influential. And that was one of the deviations they created is Al-Manzila Bain al manzilatayn Now, you go to the Sunnah, there is nothing like that. You know, there is a Mu'min, there is a Muslim, and you can discuss the differences, we spoke about that. And there is a kafir. And we know how someone transfers from kufr to Islam and to how to upgrade his position as a mu'min. I mean, this is all well explained in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fifth principle of Mu'tazila also sounds really good. He said, what, what can you find anything wrong with that? Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. You order the good and you know, you, you're ordering good, you, you enjoin upon people to do good and you prohibit vice. Well, their interpretation of al-amr bil-ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar is you have to use coercive methods if people don't agree with you. This is how it transformed the Mu'tazila. That if you don't believe in what I believe, you can either go to jail or go be killed. Because why? They said al-amr bil-ma'roof dhu lisani bi lisani wa dhu qalami bi qalami was a safe be safe. They said you, you order ma'roof by your tongue if you're a speaker, by your pen if you're a writer, and by your sword if you're a person of authority. So when they got to the position where they were able to get to influence the khilafah and al ma'moon became a mu'tazili, well they said it is now your duty to make amr bil ma'roof and nahi an al munkar. You're a khalifa. You have prisons, you have whips, and you have swords. And you have to use it. Use it in what? In making people believe in all these deviations. That is the history of, these are the principles of Al-Mu'tazila. Any question about uh, the, the principles of Mu'tazila? Okay. Now, next inshallah we will uh, speak about the great tribulation that hit this ummah. The story of Al-Mu'tazila is they were able to get into the court of Al-Abbasid. Now Harun al-Rashid was very strict with al-Mu'tazila, radiyallahu anhu, rahimahullah. And he would, when, when he would hear any of the deviation like khalq al-Qur'an, like the Qur'an is a creature, or he would hear any of the speech of al-Qadariyya, you know, these people that believe that a servant creates his own actions, etc. He would say, if any of them would come up, they will lose their head. I mean, he was very strict with the Mu'tazila. However, his son, Al-Ma'moon, who was not the Khalifa after the, the, the Harun al-Rashid, he was, there was Harun al-Rashid, then his son Al-Amin, then there was a fitna between Al-Amin and Al-Ma'moon, Al-Amin ended up being killed, and Al-Ma'moon takes power. Al-Ma'moon was, was a very, very intellectual person. He was exposed to a lot of different philosophies. He was exposed to uh, the Greek philosophy, he was exposed to Persian uh, philosophy, he was exposed to more than one religion, and worse, he was exposed to Mu'tazila. Mu'tazila were, were very close to Al-Ma'moon, and they were able to convince Al-Ma'moon with their aqidah. And Al-Ma'moon became one of the Mu'tazila. And for many years, in, in the life of Al-Ma'moon, uh, he would not really practice his atizat. He, uh, he would do it, but he would not force anyone to do it. The Ummah was really tested by a person who, who changed this whole thing into a very bad ordeal. And that person, was his name was Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad. Now that name will, will be a frequent uh, theme for the next, maybe the rest of the session and the next session. This person, Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad, became the wazir for al Ma'mun. Now wazir, there was no really a, a committee of wuzara. The wazir meaning that was the vice khalifa. Right, so, so, if, if that is a word. He was the prime minister, if you will. He was the second in command for the nation. And he was the first advisor, advisor to the Khalifa, and the closest person to the Khalifa. And that person was a Mu'tazili, and he was a fanatic Mu'tazili. Not only a Mu'tazili, 
He was a Mu'tazili that wanted, uh, he was putting a lot of pressure on the Ma'mun to really force the Ummah to become a Mu'tazila. He would try to do a lot of that. And then Ma'mun was really testing the political and the religious atmosphere. And he was waiting till the time was right to do what Ahmed ibn Abu Du'ad was influencing al Ma'mun to do. And there were many scholars at that time like Harun ibn Yazid and others. And al Ma'mun would say, wait until that person dies. Because we cannot really, I mean, his popularity and the people trust that person. You cannot really fight back. You know, you will create a tribulation. So this was cooking on for a long time until the year 218. Uh, the, the, one of the things that really uh, was the central theme for this tribulation that happened was Khalq al-Qur'an was the idea about the, the creation of the Qur'an. Is the Qur'an, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it a creature? Now this idea by itself was brought long before the 218 Hijri. Before the 218 Hijri when the Ma'moon forced the ulama to accept that, that idea or that theme. First person that said that, according to most historians, was a man called Al-Ja'd ibn Dirham. Al-Ja'd ibn Dirham, he brought a lot of issues at the time of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, at the time of Bani Umayyah. He said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not talk to Musa, alayhi salam. He started bringing all of these ideas that we, we were just uh, talking about. And uh, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, rahimahullah, uh, ordered for him to be jailed and imprisoned, and he sent him to Amir al-Iraq. His name was Khalid al-Qasri. Khalid al-Qasri uh, brought him on the day of Eid al-Adha, this person that brought up this innovation. And he told everyone on after Khutbat al-Eid, go and make your udhiyah, your sacrifice, I will sacrifice al-Ja'd ibn Durham. My sacrifice today is al-Ja'd ibn Durham, and he was executed for bringing that particular innovation. But that, those ideas uh, went on after al-Ja'd ibn Durham to a person called al-Jahm ibn Safwan. Al-Jahm ibn Safwan was one of the people that took those ideas from al-Ja'd ibn Durham and started spreading them. And actually, uh, Jahm ibn Safwan is a head of a group called Al-Jahmiya. Al-Jahmiya became a deviated group, just like the Mu'tazila. They had different beliefs. But some of the beliefs they had was the Qur'an is not the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they were opposite to the Mu'tazila in matters of Qadr. Al-Jahmiya were Jabriya. They, were, they said that everything we are predestined for everything and we should not be taken into accountability for anything because we are uh, only the tools of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have no choice. Now that is also a total deviation to the other extreme of Al-Mu'tazila. So uh, you will see some of these groups, they would have some things in common and some things that actually would have opposite extremes. So this group that called al- Al-Jahmiya is from Al-Jahm ibn Safwan and he also uh, started talking about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the people that were affected by these words, the man called Bishr ibn Ghiyath. Bishr ibn Ghiyath al-Narisi, he was one of the great scholars, but he took these ideas and he became a Mu'tazili and he deviated and he had a lot of influence on the, uh, the Abbasi period and he had a lot of influence on the court of Al Khalif Al Ma'mun. And he also was a murja. He was from the people that had, uh, you know, extreme uh, uh, belief and hopes. They said, if you are a mu'min, you can do all the sins you want, as long as you believe in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and you will not be punished. So these are the, the murja, and we spoke about that. So you see, all of these groups were springing up all at the same time. But the, the Mu'tazila took idea from here, and another idea from there, and started to conform things to logic. But at the same time, they thought they were defending Islam against the people of literal understanding and figurative understanding of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against al-mushabbiha. So what happened in the year 218? In the 218, uh, al-Khalifa al-Ma'mun, as he was affected by Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad, he declared that the Qur'an is a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That became the focal point to, div- to differentiate who is a Mu'tazili and who is not a Mu'tazili for, the, for that period. Al-Ma'mun declared that the Qur'an is not the words of Allah, it's a creature of Allah. 
in the, in the year 212. So that was about six years before they actually declared, they actually forced other ulama to do it. And like we said, Al-Ma'mun was waiting till the political atmosphere is right, till things were right so he can declare that. So what happened in 100, 218, Al-Ma'mun wrote to his, uh, to the man who was in charge of the police, Al-Shurqa in Baghdad, to you say the head of intelligence or the uh, minister of interior, you know, what today. He, the man who had the, the power to apply the orders and the authority of the government. And this is not a scholar. Now here is the Khalifa ordering a policeman to do this. What did he ask him to do? He said, and this is a, a long letter, but I will give you some of the highlights of this. This is a very famous letter. Anybody that goes back to the books of history that will talk about the Mu'tazila or this tribulation that happened, you will find the entire text. But I took some experts of that. And that he would say, لَقَدْ عَرِفَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنَّ الْجُمْهُورَ الْأَعْظَمُ وَالسَّوَادَ الْأَكْبَرُ مِنْ حَشْوِ الرَّعِيَّةِ وَسَثَلَةِ الْعَامَّةِ مِمَّنْ لَا نَظَرَ لَهُ وَلَا رَوِيَّةَ وَلَا اسْتِدْلَالَ بِدَلَالَةِ اللَّهِ وَهِدَايَتِهِ وَالْاسْتِضَاءَةُ بِنُورِ الْعِلْمِ وَبِرْهَانِهِ أَهْلُ جَحَالَةٍ بِاللَّهِ وعمي عنه وضلالة عن حقيقة دينه وتوحيده والإيمان به. He said, Amir al-Mu'mineen knows that most people are blind and they are ignorant and they are led by their ignorance uh, away and astray from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from Tawheed. Now Tawheed to them, you see what Tawheed means to the Mu'tazila, is to deny some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have, I started with these principles, so when you, when you hear a Mu'tazili calling for Tawheed, you know what he's calling for. Mu'tazili is calling to, to know Allah as Mu'tazila know Allah. Tawheed to them, that's what it means. So Imamun is saying that you, that most people don't know Tawheed. Most people don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's telling that most, most of my, you know, most of my subjects, most of Muslims don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet sallallahu said, لا تجتمع أمتي على ضلالة. Muslims cannot be, do not be unified on something that is wrong. And the ijma' of the ummah and ijma' of the ulama at that time was on the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Mu'tazila were still a very small minority, but they had influence in the higher authority of the Khalifa. Many of the, uh, of the scholars and the historians said, most likely what happens is Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, this wazir, this prime minister, he is the one that actually wrote this letter. And because it is different, it is number one, it's written in a different uh, method than, than the usual writing of Al Ma'mun. The other thing is, every time Al Ma'mun is mentioned, he is referred to as a third person. لَقَدْ عَرِفَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَعَلِمَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ did that. And Amir, he didn't say, I did that and I know this. And the letter would say, Amir al Mu'mineen knows this and Amir al Mu'mineen knows that. But most scholars agree that it was sent by the permission of Al-Ma'mun. It was not sent without the Ma'mun's knowledge. But the, most likely the person that wrote the actual words were Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad, was this person that wanted to change the Khilafah. And he said in this book, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا We made him an Arabic book. And everything Allah made, Allah created. So that means, you know, again, using logic, common sense. They said, since Allah said, inna ja'alnahu, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it. Now, Ahmed ibn Hanbal will reply to that. So just be patient with all of these. And then he said, he speak, then he speaks about the a'imma, the, the ulama of the ummah. They said, ra'a amir al-mu'mineen. Again, in a third person, amir al-mu'mineen sees, anna ula'ika sharru al-ummah wa ru'usu al-dalala. That those ulama, those scholars, are the most evil beings among this ummah. And they are the people that are misleading this ummah. Now people like Ahmed ibn Hanbal and uh, you know, uh, Muhammad ibn Nuh, they are the people that are misleading this ummah. And Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad is the one that is really calling people for guidance. And they said, he, they are lisanu iblis and natiq. They are the tongue of iblis on this earth. Now the ulama of this ummah. You see this, this, this is filled with bitterness and it's really not befitting of a khalifa to say. That's why really most scholars say this is coming from a heart that is filled 
with envy and hatred and bitterness. And it cannot really come either from a person who had a lot of enmity towards these ulama and someone like Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad. And there were a lot of historical uh, uh, you know, issues that will really support that. But it's still a theory. I mean, this is not, uh, not a given fact. So, by, in this letter, the, the bottom line in that, in al Ma'mun said, Ijma' man hadaraka min al quda Gather all the judges, all the justices, everybody who has a position, a judge in this ummah. Waqra alayhim kitab Amir al Mu'mineen. And read for them the book, the letter of Amir al Mu'mineen. Fabda' bintihanihim. Then start testing them and see what they will tell you. Fabda' bintihanihim, madha yaqulun. فيما يقولون وأعلمهم أن أمير المؤمنين غير مستعيل في عمله ولا واثق فيما قلده الله واستحفظه من أمور رعيته بمن لا يوثق بدينه وخلوص توحيده ويقينه He said, let them know, those judges, those scholars, that Amir المؤمنين will not use them in his affairs. Meaning, if you're a judge and you don't believe what Amir المؤمنين is believed in, you're fired. If you're a person of in any position, then Amir al-Mu'mineen will not use you anymore. I mean, that was the first degree of threat. And then he said, start asking them and start bringing them into your court and ask them with witnesses. So, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim brought the first group of ulama and first group of people that are in positions of authority and the government. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal was not part of that. Because Ahmed ibn Hanbal always avoided being part of the governments. But many of the great scholars of the Ummah who were in positions of authority were brought. And of them was Muhammad ibn Sa'd. He is a writer for Al-Waqidi, who is a known scholar. And Yazid, uh, um, Abu Muslim, uh, who was a student of Yazid ibn Harun. Now Yazid ibn Harun was a great scholar of Sunnah. And Ma'mun was waiting for Yazid ibn Harun to die so he can start this. So he brought his students. He wanted to get these people, not, not the great scholars, but the people around them, to test the water, to see how things will go. I mean, they were, they were really doing this in a, in a smart way. They didn't go to the highest tier of scholars. They started with a little bit of, you know, higher scholar, high scholars, but not, you know, your top. Because if, if, if things didn't go well, then they, they'll create a big problem. So what happened? They brought Yahya ibn Ma'in. Yahya ibn Ma'in was one of the greatest scholars, one of ulama al-rijal, and many others. And, and when, they, when they heard this height, this intense tone in that letter, they all replied that they would believe what Amir al-Mu'mineen believes in. So testing the water worked. The first group of the ulama of the Qubat, for one reason or the other, now some of you know, history judges these people, but their judgment is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of them were afraid for their lives. Some of them, they showed what Amir al-Mu'mineen wanted, but they, in their hearts they were you know, still believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to believe in him. And some of them just wanted to keep their position. Some of them they wanted just not to be uh, tested or, or, or be uh, in, in type of tribulation. So that, that first letter put really put the, the stage, made the stage for the second, the second phase of this group. Now the second phase is the same thing to this police chief in Baghdad, to Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. And then he said after that, it is the affair of Amir al-Mu'mineen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make his words into a book. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's the Qur'an is only a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, whoever doesn't say that, لَيْسَ يَرَى أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لِمَنْ قَالَ بِهَذِهِ الْمَقَالَ حَظًا فِي الدِّينَ وَلَا نَصِيبًا فِي الْإِيمَانِ Whoever doesn't say this, who says the Qur'an is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they have none of iman and none of Islam. He said they are kuffar. Those who say Al-Qur'an, kalam Allah, they are kuffar in the eyes of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And Amir al-Mu'mineen would not accept their shahada, they're, they're as witnesses. He will not accept them as uh, any uh, people of authority and he would not accept them within the realm of Islam. But in that letter he said, bring me Ahmed ibn Hanbal, bring me Al-Qawariri, bring me Sajjada, bring me uh, Sa'dawih al-Wasiti. And he started going into the highest tier of the ulama. He started going into the, the people that, the, the ulama that entire ummah trusted. 
Now, he wants to spread this matter. He wants to really take... He, since, since the first group uh, replied positively, now he wants to be even harsher on the second group. And he said, Bro, bring these people and let them be tested for Khalq al-Qur'an. What happened in the court of Al-Ma'mun, in the court of Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, inshallah will be saved for next session. Because uh, we're out of time. Um, I'm being in the show business now. <laughs> and, uh, next session, inshallah, will be next week. But if anybody has, a, maybe we have a time for a comment or two or a question or two. Jazakallah. Brother Ifba. Alaykum Yeah, the the uh, the question is, what what really what was the objective? What motivation? What motive the Mu'tazila had to do this? I mean, uh, Allahu A'lam. Number one, the Mu'tazila when they started, they started as defenders of Islam. They were trying to defend a certain uh, deviation, and they but the method they used was a deviated method. Was was philosophy? Was common logic? And they didn't, you know, the, the Islam, the Ummah was deviated, ulama, were three groups. And the first group known as Al-Mu'tazila. Uh, al, uh, and then Ahlul Kalam, and then Al-Muhadithun. Mu'tazila, which used completely on philosophy and common sense and logic. And you have Al-Mutakallima, or the people of speech. And they used common sense and common logic, but they depended a little bit more on text. On, on, the, on this, and they had some deviation with the people of the Sunnah, but they are never considered kuffar. They are considered some, uh, they are innovators. And there are the muhaddithun, the people of hadith, like Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah. So there were these three really uh, uh, schools, if you will, of, of approach to religion. And people just get asabiya, they get zealous, zealous over their own methodology. And they want to prove that I am right and you are wrong. And even, you know, and, and they really got sucked into this premises and they felt that that's what they, you know, what they should lead the entire ummah to. And the, the main problem was not in their deviation as per se, was they would not accept discussions. I mean, you will see that we will speak inshallah in a little bit more detail in the next session. They had good arguments from people like Ahmed ibn Hanbal and, and many other scholars. But they would not accept that. They would say, kill him Amir al mumini I mean, the, the reply to argument is not, this is my argument. The reply is, kill him. You know, let's get rid of him. He's, the, he's our only obstacle. So that, that was, you know, when, when really the Mu'tazila uh, trying to force people on the deviated path. Harun al-Rashid or al-Ma'mun? Al-Ma'mun, he was an open, I mean, he was, uh, he was an educated person. Al-Ma'mun was a person uh, who was really highly educated. He was an intellectual. And he didn't have the proper teaching. I mean, he didn't have the, he didn't follow the proper schools, which is the school of hadith. And Allah knows why is that. You know, it's a tribulation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained on this ummah. And he followed into this philosophy thing. And that was what he liked. And uh, subhanAllah, that's what, what happened. Jazakallah, very well said. And inshallah we will conclude with that and uh, uh, with dua and inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept our deeds and keep us on the right path and uh, teach us of our religion things that actually, again, I want to remind myself and all of us that we're studying these things not because it's entertaining, that's because it's nice to hear or it's a matter of curiosity. It is really to try to know two things. Number one, how much these scholars suffered for our religion to really transmit Islam the way it is so we have it today. The other thing is for us to be very vigilant against deviation, to understand that deviation can come in the best forms and things that, you know, you said make sense, things like that. And like, you know, Brother Umar said, human logic and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wisdom are, you know, sometimes they conform and it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes if they don't, we don't try to apply our logic 
to the our subhanahu wa ta'ala's creator's wisdom inshallah so we keep that in mind aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah alazim li wa lakum subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin